Hi, Gloria June. Thank you so much for being on your small business podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. You know, I'm in Los Angeles. The weather is great. We've been blessed with fabulous weather out here on the West Coast. So I have nothing to complain about. Amen. What is the what's the temperature? I'm getting jealous. <laughs> Today, it's a little colder. I think it's in the upper 60s. Okay. Yeah, I think it's in the upper 60s today. Well, that's that still sounds great that. to me. It does. It sounds great to me. So again, welcome. And just tell us who you are first, who you serve, what you do, and how your entrepreneur journey, uh, entrepreneur journey has led you to where you are today. Sure. So I'm Gloria Joom, as you mentioned. I am a CFO and profit strategist. I work with small businesses specifically to accelerate their profit. Um, I often say that revenue growth gets all the press, <laughs> yeah. but profitability often is one item that's not addressed as much as I'd like to see it. And so this is one of the areas that I focus on in my business, um, how I got here. So I think I would start with my family background. You know, my mom and my aunts and my cousins were all um, entrepreneurs, were from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, they moved to the United States and their adventures into entrepreneurship continued. But I know, and I was able to observe that maybe their businesses were not as successful as it needed to be because they lacked probably the resources in order to um, scale as quickly as they needed to. And I think to one challenge we see with a lot of small businesses of color, um, many of them are owned by one individual and there aren't too many additional employees in the organization who could bring other skill sets to ensure that the business is successful. Yes. And so, yeah. <laughs> and so how did I get here? Um, I think from a child, you know, my mom being an entrepreneur, she understood how difficult it was. She encouraged my siblings and I to pursue a more predictable form of income, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, not the ups and the downs. And so because of that, there was a lot of focus on going to college mm -hmm. and then after college, you know, I then decided to pursue an MBA. And then naturally, I started working in corporate America. I know lots of people, you know, their interaction or experience with, with corporate America is not often optimal. But I must say I had a pretty good experience in finance. That's a very important um the company I worked for for the longest, that was a very important um, function, finance, that yeah. is. And so we were all we were often looked to for, you know, our expertise, our leadership. And in doing that, I realized some of the things that some of the intentional things that we did in corporate America mm -hmm. in order to make sure that the company was successful and that our revenue and our profit were both very predictable. I found that based upon my interaction with small, you know, my personal family businesses, right? Mm -hmm. They never did that type of mm -hmm. strategy, right? And 10 years ago, my husband, who has a similar upbringing to to me, you know, where he pursued college and so on and so forth. But 10 years ago, he decided that I'm going to start my own, I'm going to start my own business. But mm -hmm. I continued in corporate America. And because he started his own business, I was his CFO, of course. Okay. <laughs> I was a CFO. So from day one, you know, I instilled, um, 
a level of discipline in mm -hmm. in the way that he managed his finances to ensure that his business was sustainable and he you know generated enough profit that would allow him to set funds aside for a paycheck every month and yeah. you know put funds aside for retirement and so on and so forth but you know going back to me the company i worked for for the longest i always worked remotely because it was a global company um over time due to real estate challenges we started working more and more at home so mm -hmm. um i got to a point in 2000 2019 where the company announced a voluntary early retirement um, package. I raised my hands because <laughs> this is so over good. here, it's me. <laughs> yeah, I was in Los Angeles, and I was ready for a change. I wanted to go have coffee with you know people in the office, and I said, I "I'm I'm just gonna switch it up for a bit." And so I raised my hand and that was at the end of 2019, but because mm -hmm. of the nature of my job, I wasn't able to leave immediately. So mm -hmm. we made an agreement that I was going to leave on March 30th, 2020. <laughs> oh, wow. They say, no, you gotta stay a whole nother year. You can't leave yet. <laughs> yes. March 30th, 2020. And what was interesting is that it was in the middle of the pandemic yeah and i had all these plans of living my best life for six months travel the world until wow. i decided what was the next chapter in my life but unfortunately i was mm -hmm. stuck at home right wow. i was stuck at home and there I was watching tv sitting on these webcasts listening to the challenges that were being experienced by small businesses mm -hmm. right? it was even worse than i anticipated it was disheartening mm -hmm. the number of businesses that were failing in the meanwhile there was a little devil on my shoulder because the company that i had worked with had given us you know hr consultants to help us transition to you know, more of the same, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, to the next job, doing yeah, the same thing. More of the same. And I decided, you know, I engaged them for a little bit, but as I was listening to these stories day in and day out, I just felt for the first time in my life, I knew what I needed to do with the rest of my career. I knew I could not continue to work in a large corporation anymore. I felt like it was so important that with the skills that I had acquired for all these years that I could put it into best use by working with smaller businesses. And so I transitioned to working with small businesses. And that's mm -hmm. that's how I became an entrepreneur full time. That's a great story. I mean, yeah. it is, it's great what happened because now instead of I mean, it is what it is. I mean, you saw that small business owners needed more of your, your help, your assistance. Than yes. Corporations. And what better way to help people who, who need you? So it's a win win. It's definitely a win-win and I really do love it. I remember a few years ago, I had a friend who had left the large corporate client she had been working with and did her own thing and, you know, would go back and forth about the income we earn in corporate America, which was substantial. Right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> And I would say to her, because, you know, when you start your business, it doesn't, you know, the yeah. income doesn't come immediately. I'd say, don't you miss that? You know, and she says, yeah, I do. But the joy and satisfaction mm -hmm. I get from owning my own business, there, I cannot, I cannot substitute that joy and passion for anything else. Wow. And that's that's when you know you are doing what you're supposed to do. You this is your purpose. This is why God has 
one one reason why God has put you here to do this to help people yes. this way. That's a great feeling, and so many people are looking for that that yes. feeling. That's great when you find it. Yes. Um, so you have um, on my guest form that you filled out. You had stated that twenty five percent of businesses fail in the first year, and then fifty percent fail within five years. So what would you say are some of those reasons for that devastating percentage of failed businesses? I would definitely say one of the most critical issues that cause so many businesses to fail would be cash flow challenges. And by cash flow, I mean knowing how much money you have, mm -hmm. being able to track it, being able to forecast it, right? Being right. able, you cannot wake up on a daily basis and assume that, well, I could sell 10 widgets today and hopefully those 10 widgets will cover my rent tomorrow. It's not like that, right? Mm -hmm. You need to create some sort of a methodology where you're able to forecast your revenues in one year, maybe two years, three years. It gets, of course, a lot less detail as you move into the future. But cash flow challenges um, definitely is an issue because sometimes you will hear stories about a million dollar business with cash flow challenges, a million yeah. dollar business with a line around the corner of the building, but yet they struggle with cash flow. And mm -hmm. I think the larger the company is, the more challenges it has. Because I think sometimes when the businesses are small, there's a tendency to, you know, keep closer track of the spending. But I think as the businesses grow, the owners become a little overwhelmed. <laughs> the yeah. owners become a little overwhelmed and may simply allow, allow their staff privileges, right, to spend without necessarily putting the controls in place yeah. or without necessarily having a budget. Because if you believe that you will generate a million dollars in sales in a particular year, it's really important that you set a budget for how much is it that you could spend in operating expenses, such mm -hmm. as marketing or the rent in the facility, and how many resources employees you will have. And of those resources, for example, how many of them should be contractors versus, you know, fixed costs. So in other words, if the business takes a downturn, what flexibility are you left with? Mm -hmm. You still have to cover their payroll. So the concept of forecasting, understanding what expenses in your business could be fixed versus variable, making sure there is a nice balance between the expenses that you incurred that are fixed versus variable, Mm -hmm. All of those um, important things that should be taken into consideration. And I think another aspect of why businesses fail in year two, three, four, and five could sometimes be associated with having access to capital. Because sometimes businesses need access to capital. They need a line of credit mm -hmm. just to, I guess, manage some of the periods where um, the revenues are a little light. And like they say, very often, you should not look for financing when you need it. <laughs> you <should>. That's true. <laughs> you That's how you're going to pay it back. <laughs> exactly. You need to be proactive, right? You yeah. need to be proactive and say to yourself, I will establish a line of credit with um, with a particular financial institution. So if for some reason... Um, I need it in the future. Um, I have access to it. And, you know, it's unfortunate sometimes, you know, with credit profile issues, mm -hmm. you know, because I think we all tend to believe that if we create an LLC, we could go to the bank and 
you know, they will give us credit based on right. how, you know, mm -hmm. EIN number and our LLC number. Unfortunately, you know, the bank looks at you in the initial phases. They will look at your credit score and they will decide whether you are credit worthy because right. they, they want to make sure that you have the ability to pay your debt. Mm -hmm. That right? is true. That is true. You know, I keep seeing on uh, Facebook, on different platforms, you have people saying that they can help you get a business line of credit, even if your credit score is low and even if this or that. And I see a lot of I've been wanting to say something, but, you know, it's like I'm not a banker. I'm not a financial person. You know, who's going to listen to me? But I'm thinking to myself, are y'all really believing this? And people really are taking their hard-earned money, giving it to some of these people, thinking that they're going to help them build this line of credit when their credit is 300, 320. And I'm like, who do you, who do you, you think this is a magician? Or like, what is going on? But people are really believing it. And I'm seeing a plethora of people online doing that right now. And a lot of the business Facebook groups that I'm in and people, people say they want to say when I say this, but I, it's a lot of people of color that I see doing this. And I'm realizing they're doing it because a lot of us don't know. Yes. And so they're handing over their money to these people. And I'm like, they are really believing that they can get a business line of credit and they don't have good personal credit. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm seeing a lot of that right now. <laughs> And I don't fully, I don't fully understand it. But one thing I do know is that you could only really keep your scores high by paying your bills on time, making sure that your utilization rate is low and, you know, just pay your bills on time, right? Pay your bills really? on time. Making sure your utilization is low. These are some of the things, making sure you don't have too much credit in your name. But I do, I do hear and I see people promote these, um, <clears throat> yeah. you know, these questionable businesses. businesses they say they have. Because I'll be reading some of it. I'm like this. And then it's like, They'll make a post and then there's hundreds of comments where people are like, I want more info, I want more info. And I'm like, oh my God. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know either. I wish there was something I could figure out to stop it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know. All I do is I all my bills as much as possible. Yeah. Are automated. Um, I don't max out my credit cards. I right. pay my credit cards every month. I keep a zero balance. These are the things I do at my credits over 800. So, right. Exactly. Um, yeah. You had said that um, today the emphasis is on the revenue growth. Um, it's not on that bottom line. So elaborate more on that statement about this whole emphasis that we keep hearing about and it's not really getting down to the nitty gritty of what we should be focusing on. Yes, and I think that is so important. Um, you and I met on you and I met on social media, and we know over the last few years there are lots of business coaches, right? Which is great. Ooh, it's a lot. Yes, a lot, and lots of business um, coaches make a commitment to small businesses to scale their revenues, go to 20K months and 50K months. Um, and they often use the adjective profitable, right? Mm -hmm. Profitable 20K months and profitable 50K months. Um, I do not deny that they do provide the businesses with the necessary skills to scale. However, Within the curriculum, there is not much emphasis or training or education on how those businesses could do so profitably, right? Because it takes it takes a unique set of skills mm -hmm. in order to ensure that a business is profitable. So while you may say, I'm gonna grow your, I'm gonna grow your 
your revenues to a million dollars, right? We need to sit down. We need to understand the expenses that are required for you to get to a million dollars. We need to put it on paper. We need to understand, for example, how many resources you need to get to a million dollars, how much you could spend on marketing, Mm-hmm. And how much you could spend on training. And I like to think of these concepts as a percentage of revenue. So if you're if you're spending a million dollars, if you're generating a million dollars of revenues and you say, well, I could spend between five to 10 percent on marketing and maybe I could spend 20 percent on the resources that actually do the work in order in order to generate the revenues. You have to think about what is left over from that point for you to maybe take your professional development classes in order for you to pay the rent of your business facility and so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, one thing that you need to prioritize is how much could you afford to pay yourself? Right. Because I hear the stories over and over and over again about these businesses who have continued to operate year in and year out. Their revenues continue to scale, but yet Mm -hmm. they still say to me, Gloria, I have not been able to pay myself in a predictable manner for years, right? And that's the first thing, you know, (laughs) I put it on paper. I know there are lots of people who are ultra smart and they believe that they could manage their business in their brains, but I (laughs) think that's possible, right? (laughs) I use spreadsheets. Spreadsheets. Yes, that's what I do. Cause I I, I can't keep all that in my head. (laughs) It's too much to keep in your head. And you know, create spreadsheets and we do different scenario analyses we say okay well if we're actually going to do one one million in revenues what if we you know hire five resources and spend 10 percent in marketing versus you know 15 percent in marketing and what if we spend twenty thousand in rent versus ten thousand in rent how much could we afford to pay ourselves on a monthly basis Right. And how much could we set aside in order for us to fund our retirement account? And how much could we set aside in order to create our play account? Especially women. One thing I try to do is as we create a, 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 a structure for mm-hmm. them to pay themselves, I say, yeah, here's what you should <laughs> pay yourself. But every month... I want you to decide, well, we'll decide in advance. This is how much I am going to put into a retirement plan. Mm -hmm. And I also say, most importantly, how much is it that you are going to set aside to invest in the market on your own? I think that's the funnest and most exciting thing we could do as women to dabble with the market Mm -hmm. on our own, right? Yeah. Yeah. And another thing that's important is I stress the importance of creating a reserve, a reserve fund. And the reason why having a reserve fund is important is, you know, let's think back to March of 2020 or April of 2020, within weeks of COVID, right, the shutdown, Mm -hmm. we heard businesses that had to shut their door. Yeah. Right. If you have no reserves in place to fund your fixed expenses that will continue to incur, then it's really difficult for you to fall asleep at night. Right. (laughs) Those fixed ones, they're not going anywhere. That's your rent, you know, that you got to pay every month and all of that. Like that's something every month that's going to come up. And if you don't have any reserves, you can't pay it if you have to. Well, if we have to go back on lockdown or something like that. But I'm noticing that, you know, you are hitting on things that most don't because you're right. More people 
are focused on that revenue growth. Let me show you how to make all this money. Let me show you how to make the, the 10K months, the 50K months. But no one hits on the reserves, the retirement plans, you know, making sure that you have a budget, you know, have money, you know, over for marketing and or even to pay for your to give to yourself. No one hits on that. I've done a few business coaching courses. Mm -hmm. Not going to say, you know, whose it was, but I will say they did not hit on that. And a lot of right. them don't. A lot of them, I don't want to call their information fluff. Right, right. But some of it might can be a little fluff because that right there is the foundation of your business. What you're all what you're explaining. Right. And I think what's important, what's important to always note that you can't get all your skills and education from one person. While mm -hmm. I mentioned some of these coaches are really great at yeah. what they do, they'll help you scale your business. But from a similar perspective where many times you will hear businesses say to me, well, I have my bookkeeper and I have my CPA I do my taxes with, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I say, no, you're not because different people fulfill different requirements for your business. For example, a bookkeeper fulfills a very essential role. If you do not have the means to track your spend, someone like me, a profit strategist, mm -hmm. it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard for me to evaluate and analyze your business performance because I don't have, it's almost like, you know, going to the oncologist and not having the results of the blood test. Right. Right. Or, <laughs> right? It, it's, it's like that. And I say, you must start with something. Mm -hmm. You must, whether you do, you, you do a paid QuickBooks subscription, which is great, mm -hmm. whether you hire a bookkeeper at say $150 a month, or there are free online software tools such as um, Wave, okay. right? Or Wave is a free tool, which is great. Of course, it has its limitations because you're not paying for it. But I think it's it's great for a new business to yeah. track its expenses. So you start having, you know, decent good bookkeeping, right? You go see your tax accountant, but don't allow, for example, your CPA to create your Schedule C's for you or your 1040 without having a dialogue. And the reason why that is so important, I, I have to go back to 2020. Mm -hmm. We had, for example, the PPP that was made available to small businesses. Mm -hmm. Initially, the rules for the PPP um, required for um, businesses that reflected bis their their financials on a Schedule C, you had to reflect a profit. Yes. Yes. Remember, that was the yeah, first yeah. Months. months and months later, they changed it and they looked at the top line, right, gross revenue. But initially it started off where they said your profit on your Schedule C determined whether you were, how much you were going to qualify for, um, for the PPP. And there were many businesses who, for the first time, they looked at the Schedule C and said, oh, wait, year after year, it seems that <laughs> my tax, my CPA, my tax accountant, or, you know, enrolled agent, whoever it is that you see, um, has been reflecting that I'm not profitable. Wow. And I never questioned them about it. I never looked at it. I never had an exchange, right? Right. Why you don't have to be, we, I'm not a tax accountant, right? I, I, but I have a discussion with my tax accountant because what is reflected in your tax return as a business determines your future, determines whether in a year or two years, when you go to the bank and you mm -hmm. ask the bank for a loan, the bank simply says to you, why would I why would I give you a loan if you have shown for the last three years <laughs> you have been unable to make a profit? 
Damn, it's zero. <laughs> well, it's not even zero. It's negative. And sometimes we'll say, well, really, I did make a profit, but, you know, the accountant, you know, the tax person did whatever, wow. and I wasn't. It's your business, mm -hmm. it's your financials. You owe it to yourself to have a sit down with your CPA and find out what it is that they're submitting to the IRS on your behalf. Yes, right? definitely. Yes. I remember when that came out, the whole PP, PPP mm -hmm. loan thing. Yes. 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 So hopefully I think a lot of small businesses um, have learned over time, right? Over the last year that before I submit my tax forms to the IRS, mm -hmm. I'm going to take a second look because I know I want to grow my business. Growth often comes with um, maybe the need for capital. Mm -hmm. And in order for me to qualify for that capital, I need to ensure that my business is profitable or I need to take some, I need to understand what's on that schedule C. That's the, yeah, that's it. I'm actually understanding it. Because like you were saying that once that came along, the whole PPP, and then a lot of people realizing like on the Schedule C, it's, not, it's showing I'm not profitable. Yeah. I bet they learned then what that Schedule C is and what should have been in it um, and learned that that a very expensive lesson um, to pay more attention. Yes. No, we just figure, oh, it's a CPA. They, they got me. They know what to do. I'm not going to worry about it. No. Yeah, and you still have to sit down with them and go over everything. Yes. Yeah, I know a lot of people did a lot of PPP scams too that I had seen <laughs> online. I was just like, how are all these people getting these PPP loans? <laughs> and it will be people that I'm not saying I know them, but I've seen them on Facebook and it's like they don't even have a business. How did you get this? I was like, oh my God, what is going on? <laughs> They're like, I need new Facebook friends, huh? I got two two pages. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope when they go to get their loans forgiven, you know, they're not going to encounter any major issues. Yeah, because I've heard of some crazy scams. And I guess, you know, in every program that's put out there, there will be yeah. some individuals who believe that they need to take what they don't really qualify for right yeah 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 unfortunately so we all know that you know the first thing to do you know when you have a business is to make that plan uh, before you start the business and i think a lot of new um entrepreneurs they fail to do that um and especially like you said making a plan for the first year the second year the third year and so on so when planning on that second and third year what are some I was going to say, what are some key areas to focus on when you're planning that far ahead? Yeah. And how I, do you track it? So I think um, in order for you to ensure your profitability in the second year and third year and the fourth year, I think it starts, you know, from a financial perspective, of course, you know, um, I think one of the most important aspects of, of managing your business is, Tracking your numbers, right? Yeah. <laughs> tracking your numbers, but it doesn't end there. You need to track your numbers because by tracking your numbers, you're able to understand the story behind those numbers. You're able to understand whether you're profitable or not. You're able to understand, for example, what parts of your business generate the most revenues or you're able to generate what parts of your business are more profitable than others. If you don't know how to successfully track your finances, I think this is where you should really seek help, right? Mm -hmm. You need to seek help of someone, especially if you're near to, um, and you're working hard at selling, <laughs> you probably should seek the help of maybe someone like myself, a profit strategy strategist to help you make sense of what the numbers are saying to you. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you may find that you're continuing to sell 
products that are really dragging down your average gross profit. And if those products that are very unprofitable are not really driving the demand for the other products in your portfolio, then the question becomes why you continue to sell that um, those products. Sometimes we believe by having, you know, the highest revenues that's mm -hmm. sexy and attractive, but I disagree. I think you need to focus on the profit. There are businesses with $200,000 in revenues with more profit than the businesses that generate a million dollars in revenues. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay? Yes. You will be surprised by the statistics, right? Mm -hmm. And it's often surprising to me number one i'm really proud i'm really proud when i see these women who have created these organizations where they're able to generate so much revenues but i'm disheartened mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm disheartened unfortunately when i see that they're not profitable and they really don't know how to get their arms around the situation. Like I said earlier, you need to pull out a spreadsheet and you need to document. You need to say, for example, next year, I expect to sell, you know, 10 of this product and, you know, 20 of product B and 30 of product C and how much is it I should price those products, right? It, you know, when you think about the products that you're selling, do you think um, there are some other alternatives that are being introduced by your competitors mm -hmm. and so no one will have a need or the demand will decline for those particular products? If so, what 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 what, what are you going to substitute, right? Or right. Do you need to lower the prices in order for you to um, continue to sustain your business? At the end of the day, you need to create that forecast. You need to be intentional to understand, right? Mm -hmm. What, you know, what you could afford to spend, assuming, for example, if your if your if your revenues are let's say 500 k or 200 k, you know, what are the expenses that you could afford? But you should create some triggers, right? What if I can't, you know, meet those revenue goals? What mm -hmm. levers can I pull, right? And right. this is the reason why we talked about what percentage of your cost structure is variable versus what percentage is fixed. Because you want to make sure that if you have any difficulty with driving the revenues, you need to ensure that you're able to adjust your mm -hmm. expenses as much as possible. Because at the end of the day, your goal is to pay yourself and not to pay everyone but yourself. Yes. And pay yourself first is always what I've heard. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, take your money. <laughs> I mean, that's what I've been told. <laughs> pay yourself first. And not just pay. I, I said earlier, so let's repeat it again. Uh -huh. Give yourself a salary, set funds aside for retirement. And, you know, I know many people, they tend to say, many business owners, they say, well, when I'm doing my taxes, I'll decide how much it is that I'm going to set aside for my retirement plan. Wrong answer. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that a little too late? <laughs> too late. I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. Because it means that if we are in the month of May, you're saying you're putting off that decision to invest for me. June, July, August, September, October, yeah. November, eight months. And just imagine if you had invested those funds in the market mm -hmm. with compound interest, right? Right. Your investment would grow, but instead you're sitting on it until April 15th or is it March 15th, depending upon your... your yeah, business. I think they've changed right. the date. Yes, depending upon what kind of business you own. You shouldn't, you shouldn't wait. 
right? Yeah. You, you shouldn't wait. You need to be proactive um, at investing and paying yourself because unless you're doing this as a nonprofit, okay, mm -hmm. your most important your, the most important criteria for managing your business finances should be paying yourself first. Yes. yes yeah. Definitely. Definitely. So, and then I guess um, kind of weaves into my next question about the pro having a good pricing strategy and how to make sure that pricing strategy is on point because, you know, you got your cost of production, you got, you know, if you have staff, you got to have that, vendors, mm -hmm. all of that. How does one go about making sure that, let's say there's someone who can't hire anyone else. They can't hire right now a bookkeeper or a CPA or anybody. They have to do it themselves. So how can they make sure their pricing strategy is on point themselves? Yeah, I like to say for small businesses specifically, mm -hmm. it's really hard to compete on price. Right. So don't make that don't make being the lowest price on the market your selling point. You should really try to promote the value that you provide to your customers. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. By communicating what value, what's different and unique for your product offering. I think that puts you in a position where you could really maximize the prices that you sell your products at. Mm -hmm. Because when you're trying to pursue the lowest price strategy, you have to sell so many more units. Yes, yes that's <laughs> right? true. Yes. So many more unit, units, you could run yourself ragged. You yeah. will be exhausted all the time. Mm -hmm. And you could burn yourself out. Yeah. Of a job. Yes. Right? And so as a small business, I think one of the most important things is making sure when you create that offering, you you create a product that's quite different to what your competitors are offering. Mm -hmm. Understand your customer base so they could see what value you bring to them. And mm -hmm. so they will be willing to pay to pay the higher prices that you're 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 setting your prices at right mm -hmm. yeah 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 and more importantly i think for those businesses um as you create your pricing strategy you need to understand what your gross margin is okay on countless occasions i deal with businesses where they may say my margins are great right mm -hmm. i have a percent gross margin and I show I say okay well show me your numbers <laughs> and they show me how they arrive at the 50 percent gross margin for example and very often there are key components mm -hmm. of the product costs that are excluded from the calculations right oh, okay yes it, it's excluded and so if you're not including all the important components of the cost of the product in your gross margin calculation, of course you will create a, well, you will be under the assumption that your gross margin is a lot higher than realistically it is. Or you will find that as you calculate your gross margin, let's say as your business grows, mm -hmm. let's say you own a bakery, right? Okay. <laughs> you own a bakery when you create a cake, right? You know, you probably want to account for the cost of the flour and the sugar and the butter and the frosting. And as your business grows, you will probably have to hire people to mix the cakes, right? Yeah, right. Businesses, sometimes they may say, well, I'm not gonna include myself in the equation for calculating gross margin. And I say, as your business grows, you will have to hire people in order to do the work for you. And it comes back to when you created a pricing strategy, you have to factor yourself, whether it be in the operation expenses arena mm -hmm. or the cost of sales when you hire people to do the actual mixing and kneading and whatever, right? right? Yeah. It needs to be accounted for 
because you're creating a situation where your business is not profitable. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So be very careful. Put it on paper. Don't mm -hmm. don't keep it up here. I know many businesses are super smart, right? I'm I'm really proud at I'm really proud of many of the women out there, especially, mm -hmm. right, who are doing phenomenally well. But at a certain point, sometimes you need to open up a spreadsheet. Yep. And if you don't know how to do that, you need to hire someone to help you, right? Form a basis for how you um, calculate your gross margin. So at least if you have the basic educations today, as you create more products in your in, in your portfolio, you can mm -hmm. do that analysis on your own because I would say 75% of the time, the businesses who tell me, and I always do that little quiz, right? Yeah. <laughs> margin, it's never accurate. Wow. It's never accurate. And again, this is the reason why, um, this is the reason why many of these businesses are not profitable because they do not account for the cost of doing business mm -hmm. when they price their products. Wow. And that says that's, that's oh that's just it's like just that answer is a whole nother episode. That's <laughs> yeah. It's it hits so so many, so many different things in the business. Cause I know a lot of people who, you know, as far as the pricing strategy, they think, oh, if I make, you know, my product a low cost, then I'll get more people to buy. And like you said, but they don't realize how much work that's going to be. You got to have triple amount of product. Um, and a lot of times, Walmart. yes. And a lot of times, especially if you have a direct competitor, a lot of times people will look at your product and say, oh, it's priced. That's priced too cheap. Something must be wrong with it. I'm going to go ahead and spend my money with the one that's most expensive. Like people never even think of it like that, but it's like, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, that's, that's, that's just a lot to take in. I really hope people are, I'm going to make sure I tell people to take notes um, during this episode because you are dropping a lot of value gems in this episode that they have to um, have to learn. Yes. Yes. And I'm, you said something that's so important. So I want to, I want to bring it, I want to uh, bring it to the table. You said people might be skeptical about your pricing strategy. If you price your product or service too low, people yes. will be skeptical. Sometimes I encounter situations, you know, where someone says, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to sell this to you at a hundred dollars when I know it's worth 500. And I question. <laughs> yeah, like, what's wrong with that? What? Oh, I don't know if I'm gonna buy that. I mean, like, <laughs> everybody knows it on on my on, on this show that I wear a lot of wigs and hair and stuff. <laughs> and I mean, that's one, one another example. If I'm at a hair store and there's some wigs and these wigs are cheaper than the ones over here, I'm like. Something must be wrong with that hair. Let me have that hair over here that's about three or four. Let me just go ahead. I mean, it is what it is. But a lot of people do have that in their mind. If I just price it lower, you know, then I'll get more people. But no, that's not necessarily so. Not yeah, necessarily. it's not so. And like I said, unless you're a Walmart where you have hundreds of thousands of employees, you have people of all different backgrounds and skill sets that allows you to sell to millions of people yes then you're able to spread your fixed costs across you know hundreds and thousands of products but us as small businesses mm -hmm. we just don't yeah. have the capacity to to compete in that space so simply create a good product simply be in a position where you're really able to articulate to your customers what mm -hmm. value and what problem you're going to solve, then people will be willing to pay you what your product is worth. Definitely so. Definitely so. Well, this has been such a great episode. I definitely have to have you back because oh, there are so many topics that we can talk about when it comes to money. 
<laughs> money and business credit and just making sure that you're making a profit. There's so many people out there, so many business owners um, that I know that I'm in groups with and they're not making any profit. And it's a it's a it's a problem across the board, not making a profit and then not knowing how to follow those numbers. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. That is one of the big, and like you said, that is one of the biggest issues for small business owners. Understand, un, you know, I know, yeah. Un, realizing that in the finance industry, we have people with different levels of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, your bookkeeper will help you, right, track your numbers, but then you need to work with someone else, right, in mm -hmm. order to make sure that you you're able to understand the story behind the numbers right and more importantly understand the strategies that you need to pursue in order to be profitable or even you know situations such as when your cpa creates your tax your tax return for you have a discussion right mm -hmm. have a discussion yeah. with that cpa make sure you understand what that CPA is submitting to the IRS on your behalf because it has implications to you and your business, your business ability to, mm -hmm. should I say, apply for for loan. Yeah, yeah definitely. In the future, right? Yes, yes, it is. Um, so where can um where can the listeners connect with you? I know you have your website. Uh, you on Instagram, and of course, I will have all of this uh, um, in the show notes and the links. But but where are you on social media? I am on Facebook. Um, of course, my name you can see; they will see my name, correct? <laughs> yeah, they will. The ones who watch the video will see your name. The ones who listen won't. But we're gonna make sure they. I'm gonna have it, of course, in the show notes. But it's Gloria June like june but it's d as in dog i o u m yes i yeah. don't think d as a dog no <laughs> d as in dancer <laughs> a dreamer yeah dreamer dancer dreamer. yeah <laughs> or oh, the name of my company is joseph management inc i named it after my father my my maiden name is joseph so therefore my business is called joseph management inc the website is j o m g m t i n c dot com and i really loved our 50 minutes <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen minutes, and you know, I really get excited um, talking to people about finances and being profitable. And there's just so much more that I would love to talk about. But um, yeah, yeah, we definitely can I, make uh, more. I have um, some people who are on multiple times, um, and I always like to start having, you know, recurring people like, "Oh, you're just." What's the word am I looking for? Someone who's on there all the time. I can't think recurring? of it. Yeah, we're current, but I was trying to think of something else. I can't, I, 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 my mind is gone. But I have people that, that's on periodically every few months. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So you definitely can be one of those people because you have so much information that we need to know as small business owners. Definitely. Yes. Yes, and I, I love to share, you know, I love to share my experience and, you know, and, and basically what I do, I, I didn't mention, I do mm -hmm. one to one consulting with, with businesses. Yeah. Um, what's different to many of the businesses who are my competitors, they often have a lot of these group trading um, sessions, but I only do one to one consulting mm -hmm. because I really believe that it is important that I sit with these businesses um, on a regular basis yes. in order to change the trajectory um, 
of the business. So I would love to work with some of your guests and mm -hmm. I look forward to hearing um, from them. And thank you so much, Janice. For You're welcome. You are welcome. And then we'll just play a really quick game of this or that. I like to close out with this game. People love it. Um, uh -oh. The guests end up like, why you say, uh-oh? Uh -oh. Have you ever played this or that? You just No. Okay. So I give you two choices and you just pick which one you like better. That's it. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be fun. You've never played this or that. I'll give you just like four or five questions. <laughs> okay. So we'll do something easy. We'll do, uh, do you watch Netflix or Hulu? Which one you like better? I would say Netflix. See, see, that was easy, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely a, a nice variation versus Hulu. Probably I don't utilize my subscription for Hulu as much as I need to, but I definitely um, get more value out of my Netflix subscription. Yeah, me too. I think, yeah, I don't know. It seems like Hulu doesn't have really good movies. Their no. movie selection isn't as good as uh, Netflix. I hate to say that, but yeah, it is what it is. But I want to do something on Hulu right now, which I started watching recently. It's called Dropout. But Dropout. Dropout. I'll leave the audience to go. Oh, back. isn't that about uh it's about that girl? What's the yeah. girl? The thermo thermos thermos yes. girl. Yes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's who that is. Is it good? It's very good, yes. Yeah, because I just watched the Netflix Netflix one on the Annie Girl. I forgot yes. her name already. Did you watch that? Right. Yeah. Yes. And yes. I had watched that one. That was bonkers. <laughs> it was crazy. Uh, let's see. Uh, McDonald's or Burger King? See? Ew. <laughs> Do you even eat that? Yeah, but she's like, no, no, no. neither one. <laughs> you don't eat that. You don't eat out? You don't eat uh, fast food? I don't either. <laughs> I eat out, but I um, I don't know when last I went to McDonald's or Burger King. So I, yeah, I don't know. It's okay. Don't pick, it. don't pick that one. <laughs> You're like, Ugh, I don't eat that food. Um, Let's see. I have a list of questions. I have a lot of questions, actually. TV shows or movies? Which one? You like shows or movies? I'd say TV shows. One okay. of my favorite is Law and Order. Yeah, I like that too. Dum -dum. <laughs> <laughs> Have you watched all the seasons for Law and Order? Yeah. Oh, one of the old seasons came back this year again. Really? Yes. You know, with what's his name? The one who was on that show with Tracy, um, Diana Ross's daughter. Oh yeah. Anthony. Oh, Anthony. Yes, because he because he's on blackish. Yes. That yes. ended. I forgot he used back. to be on Law and Order. So now he's back on Law and Order. He's back and SVU is back. So I watch SVU and that one. I tried to. What have I been watching? I think I've I've been watching it on some some channel, but I've started from like they have season one to the season, I guess now. So I've started yeah. over. Yeah, you know, I'm like on. If I'm on uh, like season four. It's really old. I'm trying to go back and get into. This back into all of that. <laughs> Man, there's so many seasons of. I ain't gonna never get through it. I'll be eight years old, still trying to catch up on Law and Order. <laughs> I, I love it. I, yeah. I love it with you. Yeah. I love the original one. It's the best. It it's great. It's great. Well, that's all the ones I'll ask you. Just a, a few quick few. People always say they have so much fun playing it. I'm like, okay, I'll just keep doing it. But yeah. thank you again for being on the show. And um, like I said, I definitely will have you back. We'll think of another topic and dig into how we can get these businesses to make money. Yes. Make yes. profit. Big yes, profit. Big profit. That's Not right. Revenue. Because big it's all profit. about revenue these days. We're talking about Profit. Profit. That's right. That's right. Thank the you. Thank the day. Profit. Yes, it is. All right. So I'm going to end.